we um, purposely give Taylor the passages that have all of the really hard names in it. Um, and uh, there is a lesson there for those of you who are keeping score at home. Um, when you get to the hard names of the Bible, just say them with confidence because no one else knows how to pronounce them either. So they'll just go, wow, that was impressive. He knew how to pronounce that name. So not, And Taylor was amazing. He got it right. So, Well, it's wonderful to have everyone here this morning. It's wonderful to be with you to share God's word. Uh, I hope you are having a glorious weekend. I have a question for you. Do you know what movie this is? Aladdin, yes. I am so glad we have our uh, kids in here with us this morning. That makes it fun, and that will keep us on track. Um, I like that, too. I've actually not seen this movie, uh, or not the new movie, but, uh, but I'm certainly familiar with the story. Now, do you know where this is in the movie? Do you remember what that's called? The Cave of Wonders. You remember what happens with the Cave of Wonders? Aladdin must enter the cave to get the genie's lamp. But there's a rule. Do you remember the rule? The rule is you are not allowed to take out anything else. It doesn't matter how amazing it looks. It doesn't matter how attractive it is. It doesn't matter how valuable it looks. If you try to take anything else out of the cave, you could end up trapped in the cave forever. That is not a bad picture for us to keep in mind as we come to Deuteronomy chapter 7. God is going to warn his people that what can look like a treasure, what could look incredibly valuable, could end up trapping them. And they aren't any different from us. We want to live like God's people in a world that rejects God. To use the biblical terminology, we are to live as holy people in an unholy world. But this can be a challenge. There are temptations that shine all around us, things that pull us away, that draw our attention. They look like they will give us exactly what they need, but in the end, they just trap us in fear, in frustration, in disappointment. Several years ago, there was someone who was very close to me who made some really, really bad decisions. She was in a relationship that she knew was wrong, but she looked at this relationship and she thought that this, this is the relationship that would give her the love and attention that she always wanted. And so she walked away from the Lord and she turned completely to this person, relying on him to make her feel loved. It wasn't long before she saw that this relationship was destroying her. But how could she get out? This was the person that she was looking to, to make her feel lovable, to make her feel wanted. She was trapped. That may not be your story, but we all know what it's like to be pulled away from the Lord by something that looks life-giving, something that looks valuable, but it just leads us to disaster. How do we keep this from happening? How do we remain faithful as a holy people in a world that is constantly trying to pull us away from God into what's only going to trap us? And that is exactly the question that gets answered in Deuteronomy 7. Now, we are in the last week of our series on the first five books of the Bible. First five books of the Bible are often called the Pentateuch, and that's why we gave this series a very original name, the Pentateuch. Now, to help us understand kind of where we are, it'll be good to go back and once again look at the big picture. The first book of the Bible is Genesis, and Genesis is about God choosing a people through whom he will bless the entire world, and eventually that blessing culminates in the person of Jesus. Then in Exodus, God freezes people who have been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, and God takes them on a journey towards a new home, the promised land. Leviticus is about God telling his people how to be his people. God shows them how sinful, fallen people can relate to a holy God. 
the book of Numbers is about the cost of disbelief and disobedience. God takes the people to the very border of the promised land and says, this is yours, go in, this is your new home. And they look at the people who are there and they become afraid and they refuse to enter. And they spend the next 40 years in the desert until there's a new generation that's ready to enter the land. And that's where we are when we come to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is made up of three sermons by Moses. Let's stop right there. Aren't you glad that my sermons aren't as long as his? His sermons are directed to the new generation. They are now at the eastern border of the promised land, the plains of Moab. And Moses is using these sermons to prepare them for life in the new home. And guess what? When you look at verses 1 and 2, you know what you see immediately? That the people of this generation are facing the exact same problem that their parents faced. There are people in the land who are bigger than they are, mightier than they are, stronger than they are. And the question is, are you going to be just like your parents and run away? Well, this generation won't. This generation is going to enter the land. But the temptation that this new generation will face will be the temptation to turn away from God. After they've moved into the land, they are going to be faced with opportunities to walk away, to be distracted by things that will look like treasures. And so, so today's passage zeroes in on how to live as a holy people in an unholy world. And what we will see is that the people must remove influences. They must remove influences that could draw them away from the Lord. They are to remember their God and specifically remember that they are treasured by this God. And they are to reflect God's character. We start in verses 1 through 5 where they are told to remove unholy influences. Now, the first paragraph is built around four commands that are designed to protect them from going after treasures that will trap them. Verse 1 sets up the situation. The emphasis is on God's work. God is about to bring them into the land. God is going to remove the nations that will oppose them. The nations in the land are bigger and stronger than Israel. That means it is only by the work of God that the Israelites can enter the promised land. The commands begin in verses 2 and 3. First, the Israelites must devote themselves or must devote the nations to complete destruction. It's interesting, the terminology that's used here actually would indicate that their complete destruction is a type of worship to the Lord. The nations were to be totally, completely wiped out. The second command is that Israel must not make a covenant with them or show mercy to them. In other words, there should not be any military or political agreement. They should not enter treaties with them. The nations are, be, are to be destroyed. They are not to be bargained with. Boy, how often do we do that with sin? Let me try to bargain with this situation. Let me try to bargain with this influence that's in my life. I can make things better. Third, the Israelites should not intermarry with these nations. This command gives us the hint that when God tells Israel to totally destroy the nation, God actually assumes that there are going to be people left alive. But God is clear. Do not intermingle culturally or relationally with these people. Again, how often do we say, man, I can step into this sinful situation because I can be an influence for good. But what is God saying in these verses? He's saying, do not unite with the nations in any way. Remove them from your presence. And verse 4 explains why. You see, if the Israelites intermarry and leave themselves open to being influenced by the nations, guess what? The nations will, in fact, influence them, and they will influence them away from God. Following other gods doesn't just mean that they'll worship these gods. It means that they will obey the laws and the rules of the pagan religions. See, here's what happens. 
the pagan religions will invent what they think their God is like, and then they will make rules that are based on it. So if they picture a God that doesn't like outsiders, guess what? Their culture becomes cruel. If they picture a God that goes from just happy to being angry on a whim, then they invent ways to try to manipulate their God and keep him happy and give God what, give God what he needs. And he is saying they will become just like those false gods. Cruel, selfish, and enslaving. And in verse 4, it says that if you do this, God is going to deal with his people. Then verse 5 gives the final command. Destroy all the tools of the nation's idolatry. The altars were where the nations would gather and sacrifice to the gods. The pillars were these big stone symbols that were set up for worship of the false god Baal. The ashram were wooden poles dedicated to the false god Asherah. And the pillars and the poles were places where people would gather for horrible religious practices. The graven images were wooden idols carved to represent these gods. God wanted them to get rid of everything that might be used to pull the Israelites into sin. You see, God is giving them the victory. He is giving them the land. God is the cause of every blessing they receive. The people must respond by removing everything that will lead them away from their relationship with God. Stop and think about that for a second. What a weird thing. If God's going to do all these things for his people, why in the world would they walk away from him? Well, the reason is because they're just like us. And people lose track of where the blessings really come from. You ever known someone who would take their ball and go home if they didn't get their own way? What's going on there? Well, it could be a number of things, but something like this. They think the blessing comes from being in control. Or maybe they think blessing comes when people respect them and not following their idea is a deep disrespect. Or maybe they think the blessing comes by everyone knowing they're in charge. You see, if you think blessing comes from things like that, you will become miserable. And you will make everyone around you miserable. How can you test where you think your blessings really come from? I'm going to give you three questions to ask. What do you think would undo you if you lost it? What do you think would undo you if you lost it? Second question. What do you think would devastate you? You did not get it. What do you think would do if you did not get it? And third, what makes you react badly if it is threatened? Whatever fits the answers to those questions is in danger of being just like the nations to God's people. It's, it's in danger of becoming an idol that can influence you and pull you away from the Lord. I'll give you an example. Marriage is an absolutely wonderful gift from God. But people turn it into an idol all the time. They make marriage the only blessing that matters to them. They sincerely do not know how life would be worth living if they were not married. And if they're married, they can't stand it if their spouse is out of their side. If they're married. They get incredibly upset if their spouse has a conversation with someone of the opposite sex. Do you see? They become trapped by the very idol that they have created. And the solution isn't to get rid of being married. It's to get rid of what is making that influence you in that way. And just practically speaking, if you identify, when you identify, because we all have them. What is in your life that tends to function as an idol and pull you away from God? What you do is step one is you get help. You go to a brother or sister in Christ and say, could you help me with this? Could you pray for me?
Have you noticed how often remembering comes up in the first five books of the Bible as you read through them? You see, not only do we need to recognize and remove the things that influence us away from God, we are told in this passage there is something that we must remember. They are told to remember what God is like. They are told to remember what God has done for them. They are told to remember that they belong to God. And you see these commands throughout the Old Testament, especially in the first five books of the Bible. And something similar is going on in verses 6 through 8. See, the point is they are to remember whose they are. Now, of all the people in, out of all the people in the world, verse 6 says, the Lord chose them to be his treasured possession. That terminology is a way of describing the gold and silver and vast riches that would be in a king's treasury. God is saying that the people are like precious gems in the king's treasury. In fact, it's saying like they are the whole treasure. Because God chose them, the people are holy. And remember, as we've gone through the series, we've identified what holy means. It means to be set apart for something. It means to be different from everything else. God's people are different because God treasures them. Verse 6 is saying that they are, in fact, holy. They have been set apart from God. They don't earn it. They don't create it amongst themselves. They are holy because God chose them to be holy. God chose them to be his treasure. Verses 7 and 8 explain why God chose them as his treasure. And it's based on two things. God's love and God's character. It's not based on anything special about Israel. They were not the biggest or strongest or most important or most impressive nation. They were just the opposite. They were the smallest and least powerful. God chose them because he loved them. And the order is important. He didn't love them because they were good enough. God didn't love them because they were holy. What made them holy, what made God want them, was simply that God wanted them. The reason God chose them as his treasure is simply because God loved them. The other reason God chose them as his treasure is his character. You see, God made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. God made a promise that their descendants would become a great nation. That this nation would have a home, the promised land, and the entire world would be blessed because of this nation. And this blessing would be in the form of Jesus. And God is going to keep his promises. In fact, he has already proven that he is going to keep his promises by delivering his people from Egypt. The reason that the people must remove the influences that could draw them away from God is because they are God's precious treasure, loved by a faithful God. And that should change them and it should change us. Beauty and the Beast is a very powerful picture of exactly how our culture thinks about love and how we almost always experience it. See, the Beast is ugly, but he can be attractive if he convinces someone to love him. And much of the story is about the beast trying to be a better person so Belle will fall in love. And eventually she does. And the beast becomes attractive again. And the intended message of the movie, of the story, is that what makes you lovable is your character, not your appearance. And that's good. But there is an unintended message to the movie. And that is that being lovable is earned. If you are good enough, then you will be loved. God turns that story upside down. He walks into the castle of our lives and see all, sees all of our ugliness. And he says, I love you like you cannot even imagine. You didn't earn my love. You just receive it. God loves us when everything about us, including our character, is repulsive. 
What if the first time Belle stumbled into that castle, she looked at the beast in all of his horribleness and said, I love you as you are, and I am here to help transform you into the amazing person that you are designed to be. What would that have done to the beast's heart to be so completely and unconditionally loved? Why wouldn't he want to change for her? And if that's how you picture God's love, you still haven't gone far enough. See, what if Bell came into the castle and said to the beast, I came here looking for you because I love you. My journey to you cost me incredible suffering, suffering that you cannot imagine. The curse that made you ugly, I took it on myself so you don't have to be defined by it anymore. And in fact, all your ugliness is on me and all of my beauty is on you. I suffered, but I delighted to suffer because of how much I love you and want to transform you into the glorious person you were always meant to be. Wouldn't the beast fall on his knees and weep? Wouldn't he pledge his life to her? Wouldn't he ask her, make me into the type of person who would do what you did? I think that's exactly what he would do. And when the truth of how God really loves us and what he did by sending Jesus for us sinks into us, it is what we do. Apart from God, there was nothing to make us lovable. We were corrupt. The Bible calls us God's enemies. And God didn't just stumble on us. He pursued us with purpose and passion because he loved us even in our ugliness. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross and take on the very curse of our sin for us and give to us the very righteousness that he has. And Jesus was raised again in three days and the Holy Spirit uses the same power to raise Jesus from the dead to transform us into people who are like Jesus. Do you really believe that in your sin you are every bit as repulsive as the beast? If so, do you grasp the love that hunted you, found you, and wants to change you? Remember how much God treasured you when you were repulsive and how much he treasures you as you grow to be more like Jesus. Remember whose you are. The people are called to remove the unholy influences. They are told to remember whose they are. And having remembered whose they are, they are to reflect what he is like. I think verse 9 is one of the most helpful verses in the Bible. The Israelites are supposed to draw a conclusion from God delivering them from Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is faithful and he loves. Right? Daily we see signs that God is at work. But what conclusions do we draw? We have a really good day. What conclusion do we draw? Do we draw the conclusion that God is faithful and loving to us? Or do we draw the conclusion that we just happen to have a really good day? We are unexpectedly encouraged by someone. What conclusion do we draw? Do we draw the conclusion that this person is really nice? Or do we draw the conclusion that God used this nice person to reflect his love? And faithfulness. You see, our temptation in an unholy world is to remove God from every equation and to see only the material in the events of life. And when we do that, we miss the love and faithfulness that is at work around us by God's hand all the time. Verse 9 and 10 go on to divide the world into two kinds of people those who love God and those who hate God. That sounds extreme, that sounds odd, but let's understand what's being said here. 
when I say I hate mushrooms, I am saying that I completely reject mushrooms. Mushrooms do not have a place in my life. If they find a place on my plate, I will cast them off quickly. I don't want to be around mushrooms. Mushrooms and I have nothing in common. We have nothing to talk about. We just stare at each other and make faces at each other. There is no such thing in my life as a good time that involves a mushroom. When God talks about people hating him, that's the picture. These people don't want anything to do with God. They completely reject him. God has no place whatsoever in their lives. So guess what? God gives them exactly what they ask for. God will not be a part of their lives. And you know what it means to be destroyed? It means to have a life without God, both now and for eternity. The people who love God are the people who God wants to be, who want God to be a part of their lives. And that's who verse 10 is written to. The people who want God to be a part of their lives experience him as they obey him. We've come across this word, be careful, before. In the Hebrew, it means to be on guard duty, to be alert, be diligent, to be persistent. We must pay attention to how we can obey God's commandments. Look for opportunities. Be eager to seize those opportunities. See, we often picture a holy life as avoiding sin. And that's part of it. But that's really backwards. You see, verse 11 tells us that holiness is active. It's pursuing. It's being alert. It's being diligent. Right? I don't just sit around waiting for a temptation to come, then avoid it and say, hey, I'm being holy. I need to be on alert. I need to be actively pursuing my relationship with God. It needs to fill my day. And the more that I do that, the more natural it becomes to obey God's commands. And you see, God's commands are not just random rules that he made up because he was bored. God's commands are meant to help us reflect his character. Because we know that the Lord God is God, we know that he is faithful and loving. We saw that in verse 9. Because we know that the Lord God is God, we know that he is just and righteous. We saw that in verse 10. And when we obey his commands and statutes and rules, we reflect that character. God has really brought to my attention over the last few weeks how often I think of holiness as just avoiding sin when I'm tempted. But being holy is more than behavior management. It's actively seeking to know God better and live like someone who does know God. So if I'm praying throughout the day, not just at meals, but if I'm praying throughout the day when I'm, when I'm alone in my car or when I'm walking to a meeting or any chance I get, by doing that, I am drawn into a deeper intimacy with God. When I read scripture, I'm not just looking for advice on how to live. I'm really looking for who is God. When I'm talking to someone, I'm trying to pay attention to how the Lord is reflected in that person's life. And as I do this, resisting temptation, being obedient becomes much more automatic. And then I reflect God's character. We do not make ourselves holy. God has made us holy. But what God calls us to do again and again in Scripture is to live as the holy people that we are in the middle of an unholy world. How do we do that? We remove the things that draw us away from the Lord. We remember that we are treasured by God. And we actively seek to reflect his character. Or to say it in a sentence. Take out what brings you down spiritually. 
build in what lifts God up? What is it that brings you down spiritually? What is influencing you to think that you can, you can find blessings somewhere other than the Lord? How are you lifting up God's character for all to see? How do you demonstrate his love and faithfulness? How do you demonstrate that you are treasured by God? Not because you're trying to earn God's love, but because you already have it, despite not earning it. There are four responses to those questions that we've suggested on your bulletin. And again, just a reminder, we really do do this. We take this seriously. If you turn in one of these connection cards, and there are boxes in the lobby where you can do that. If you turn in one of these connection cards and indicate on here how you want to apply this message, whether it's one of these four or some other way, we as a staff will pray for you because you can't do this on your own. But here are four ways that we're suggesting. Go back and read Deuteronomy 7 again and ask yourself a couple of questions. What does God do? And what does he call his people to do? Go through the discussion questions with someone. Again, we say this time and time, week after week. Why do we say this week after week? Because you can't do the Christian life in isolation. Pray verses 9 through 11. If you've not prayed scripture before, this can be one of the most profoundly helpful things that you can do. Here's what I'd suggest. Just go back through, read verse 9, and then stop. And pray, Lord, make what is true in that verse true of me. Then go to verse 10. Lord, make what is true in that verse true of me. Verse 10 is going to be about being not being something. Then go to verse 11 and spend time praying. Lord, make what is true in that verse true of me. And you know... That is just a great discipline for any part of Scripture you're reading. Just stop and read one verse at a time. Lord, make this true of me. And then a practice. Focus on one area this week where you know that you need to be more obedient to the Lord. We all sit here and we all are convicted. We can picture ways that we know what is right, but we choose what is wrong because it is this gleaming, shiny thing that looks like it will give us life. But it will just trap us. Pick one of those things and spend time in prayer before the Lord. Lord, help me to be obedient. Share with someone, this is what I'm struggling with. And pay attention to what tends to draw you towards it that you can be more aware and resist. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward as we wrap up. Why do we need to pray after a message like this? We need to pray because you cannot live as a holy person in an unholy world on your own power. It's not possible. This is not a matter of gritting your teeth and trying harder and saying, I'll be good this time. It's a matter of falling before the Lord and saying, help me, because I'm weak and I struggle. And he will. So why don't we stand together and go before the Lord and do exactly that together in the name of our Savior. Heavenly Father, we cannot live as holy people without your help. Lord, we recognize that despite everything that we are, despite all of the ugliness and sin that is inside of us, despite the fact that we started as your enemy, you loved us, you pursued us, and you brought us into relationship with you through your son. And Lord, we are blown away by that. You are the one who makes us holy. But Lord, now we need to live in response to that. And we need to live in obedience to your commands that we might reflect your character. Help us with that. Help us to resist all of the things that tempt us, that influence us, 
to follow other gods, other influences, other idols, and not you. Help us to be aware of what they are and help us to stand faithful with you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Why are these folks down here? They're down here to pray with you. But especially if you want to know the one who loved you when you were ugly, pursued you, and wants to transform you, would you please come talk to one of these folks? But they're here to pray with you about anything that you're struggling with, finances, relationships, whatever it might be. Don't try to live the Christian life alone. Here's a thought before you go. God is faithful and loving, and he treasures you. Go show the world this week what it is like to be treasured by a holy God. You are dismissed.